Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be uh, back here. Um, I have to admit I feel a little bit uh, peculiar. I'm more accustomed to jet lag, this being the third ABRS conference I've been in the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, I even managed to find out the Southern Cross in the sky, I think, last night on my own. On the other hand, I'm squeezed uh, between two Brazilians. Uh, being uh, a representative of the European Commission, and also a city boy that studied agricultural economics because that's where the money was available when I moved to the United States. So the bar is pretty high. Let's see how we do. I would like you uh, to make a step backwards because I will start in focusing on a policy response to the challenges that were previously mentioned. Although gradual, as you will see in my presentation, I will come back exactly to the same type of challenges and the, the type of policy response we gave in the European Union. However, this being a reform of a public policy, one has to more or less discuss four types of questions. Uh, those of us that are doing economic analysis used to start with a why, but having been around so many member states in the uh, European Union and also abroad, I've realized that very soon the discussion about the cap from foes and friends alike starts with the how much. So I will start with the how much, move into the for whom, the distributional issues of the policy, and then spend most of the time on the why and the how we intend to change uh, the policy. Uh, I don't know if Paul uh, Morris is in the room, but he was in Washington when I first presented this graph, and that was back in 1999. Uh, you can see that in 1999, the European Union had 15 member states. On the vertical axis, you have the cost of the cap expressed in billion euros, a very significant amount by all accounts. If you put it in perspective, a very small amount because it's a very small part of the overall EU GDP and EU public expenditure, but it's a significant part of public expenditure that goes through the community budget. What is more important before I go into the details to look into this slide is actually that the European Union keeps changing over time. There were 15 member states back in 1999. There are 28 right now. To put it a little bit into perspective, the last enlargement of the EU after 2004 has increased population from 400 to 500 million people by 100 million people. But from this 100 million people, 40% are living in predominantly rural areas. In the previous European Union of 15, the relative percentage was 18%. Uh, to put it in budgetary terms, with enlargement in 2004, we added 15, uh, well, we increased the number of farmers by 50% and the budget by 15, 1.5%. Now, what is more important is how we spend this money. This is what has always been a red flag to you, uh, which is export subsidies. And as you see, they are at zero level, and we do more or less expect that they will stay there uh, at this level. We do expect that if there is an agreement that puts everything into the table, they will also go. But that provides an agreement by everybody in WTO. What is important to keep in mind is the so-called traditional market expenditure has also keep going down. In the past, this used to be expenditure that affected public intervention. Recently, the three and a half billion euros are spent mainly in the wine and fruit and vegetable sector to strengthen producer organizations. Uh, in the future, we do expect, uh, the colors would have come, not red actually, but amber there, that uh, the, the money available for market expenditure will be at uh, current levels. The first reforms of uh, the common agricultural policy in the 90 moved into a very significant part of coupled support, support that was linked to the number of animals or the area held. And then we had the Fisler reform that moved almost 90% of, uh, in fact, more than 90% of direct payments into the coupled support. We do expect in the future, more or less, this to stay the same. There is going to be the possibility of a slight increase in coupled support because we have certain member states that wanted to give more money to sectors that are facing some problems of abandonment of production, but the overall numbers are not going to change dramatically. And on top of that, we have rural development measures focusing on three main axes. They change a little bit uh, right now, but it's either issues related to investment and competitiveness of the farming sector, 
agro-environment and now more climate uh, action and also issues related to the rural economy. So if this is the path uh, and also the structure of the money by which uh, we use to support the cap, what will happen with the new reform? It is very interesting to keep in mind that this time around, for the first time, a decision on the cap budget involves a redistribution of support among member states and also within member states among farmers. If you take all the money spent in the cap and you divide it by the eligible hectares of land, you come up with the amber line, which is the average payment per hectare in the European Union, roughly 270 something euros per hectare. The blue line is 90% of this. Now, when you do economic analysis, you know the risks of using an average that masks land productivity, differences in wages, even differences in the, in the price of coffee when you go on a, a, a long member states. But you can understand that in the political debate, differences do play a role. We start a process of realignment in the support of uh, the money that goes to farmers, with uh, on the right hand side, the three Baltic states and Romania being the winners in this redistribution and the member states that are above uh, contributing to this process. But what is important to keep in, from this process is not only the redistribution of support, but the focus on land. And here I come to the real questions of why. The first question that we had, we also, because we also have seen what is happening in the world, is the issue of food security. Now, when security comes into the forefront, some sort of insecurity should be driving the debate. First type of insecurities were issues related to price developments. Volatility, high co-movement of prices, and a very high level of prices. There were supply concerns. The slow down in productivity, climate, climate change, extreme uh, variability, and the deterioration of the terms of trade for agriculture, and demand concerns that had to do with the bottlenecks in the food uh, chain in terms of price transmission when prices go up to producers, they go up all the way to the consumer. When prices decline at the producer level, for some strange reason, they forget to decline at the consumer level. And also the impact of the economic crisis, which in certain parts of Europe has resulted in a slowdown in the outflow of labor from agriculture, and therefore removed the only real factor that helped increase productivity in the agricultural sector. Now, if you are dealing with a public policy reform process, you have to start, ask yourself the question, why, where does it make sense to intervene publicly? It makes sense to intervene where markets fail. Markets clearly fail in the environment because they're never going to give and pay the price that is necessary to be sustainable in the longer term. Markets seem to fail a little bit or a little bit more, depending on the angle you have, in the manner by which the financial crisis involves uh, uh, price volatility in the uh, price transmission I mentioned earlier. But also policies tend to fail. Even the best reform that responds to the challenges of one point of time might not be pertinent anymore if challenges completely change. And there were two types of failures that we have identified in CAP. One in terms of a fairer distribution of support, because the coupling meant that farmers get receiving what they received 10 years ago, and not on the basis of what is the focus of the policy now. And the need to more green target support, make it more environmentally sustainable in the longer term. So here comes this concept of jointness in the delivery of the private and the public good. From a short-term point of view, the last thing that a farmer wants to do when costs uh, are increasing is focus on the environment because there isn't going to be an immediate reward for that. From a longer term perspective, the last thing that a farmer has to do is ignore environment. And therefore, how you bring together and make the delivery of the private and the public good being complements and moving together is the big bet of this reform. And what is important is that we have a shift in the policy paradigm. In the 90s, we moved away from product support to support towards farmers. What we're doing right now, or what we are attempting to do, is try to focus on land. Land becomes a reference on the basis of which we measure 
how farmers are receive the money they receive. Land becomes a condition through greening and cross compliance on the basis of which land use rather remains uh, becomes a condition on the basis of which they're getting paid and changes in land use in the longer term through research, innovation, and a better monitoring and evaluation, the policy become the long-term objective of what we want to do. Now, the objectives of the CAP, uh, based on the three broad challenges we saw, economic, environmental, and territorial, are to advance viable food production, the sustainable management of natural resources and climate action, and a balanced territorial development. And we want to enhance competitiveness, improve sustainability, greater effectiveness. You would say everybody wants to do that. The important thing is how. I'll come to that. And we want the CAP to be fairer, greener, and simpler. Now, fairer the CAP is going to be. Oh, it's not going to be as fair as anybody would have liked but clearly the redistribution helps in that. Simpler, at least as simple as we want it to be, is not going to be. Why? Because for the first time in the history of the CAP, we have a process of co-decision between the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. And when you have 28 member states, and oh, at a certain point we had 8,000 amendments from the European Parliament that were grouped to around 100, obviously, the end result will be more complex than what you wanted in the beginning. So at the end of the day, how you balance out the fairer versus simpler element of the policy will be determined by how convincing we will manage to be in the greener part. And allow me with a few slides to focus on the left-hand side on the challenges before I arrive onto what we want to do with the greener part. This is the evolution at world level and in real terms of the agricultural commodity price index. And what you see uh, from 2000 onwards is a reversal of what used to be a downward trend in real terms in these prices. And if you were to discuss in Europe why you needed to support farmers four years ago when we started this debate for their income, seeing only this graph, you would ask the question, why the heck do you want to give them something they can get or the market. But if you expand a little bit the analysis, you see, first of all, that fertilizer prices moved and increased much higher than agricultural prices. The same thing happened with energy. And the same thing happened with metals and minerals that do not directly affect agricultural prices, but indirectly, because what we have seen in the last years are three parallel developments. Prices have become more volatile. There is a co-movement in commodities. And at the same time, the level is much higher than what we've seen in the past. What is also pretty important is that if you look at US energy prices, for example, where the US natural gas tended to follow the crude oil, it follows now the coal price in Australia. And we have three gas prices, natural gas prices at world level. You need to add some transport costs, of course, uh, to make the US price comparable to the European or Japanese price, but what you have clearly is a situation where energy intensive industries are moving back to the United States and where it's not only the overall economy that faces some challenges, but also the agricultural economy. So that gives a sense of the type of challenges we're going to face at the economic uh, level. At the climate change level, I'm not going to enter here into any philosophical debate, but we take it as reality. These are the four climatic zones in the European Union. You will have the PowerPoint, of course, and then you can look at the details. What is important to keep in mind is in all four of them, whether things are looking better or not from a point of view of water, of temperature and the rest, there is one risk and challenge that is common. That is, plant and animal diseases tend to be spreading faster than uh, science. And when it comes to the territorial uh, balance, uh, the greener the color in the map of the European Union, the more important the role of agricultural and rural economy is. And that gives an answer to the question that we're often asked, and why do you need a common agricultural policy? Well, assume that we take everything out of the common agricultural policy, and this is not an assumption, this is the result of very uh, significant analysis that have been done by universities in the Netherlands, 
in uh, Germany and in the UK, so member states that normally are not the ones that would like to spend more money on the cap. What is the result of the abolition of the cap? It would be not the end of production of, of food in Europe. It's been going on for centuries. But it will be the concentration of production in the most competitive regions with more pressure on the environment and an abandonment in many of what you see the greener type. So that's the role of the cap is actually to rebalance territorially what is happening. Now, these three broad objectives result to specific policy measures that I will only scratch the surface in market orientation. I have underlined what, is the mo what are the most important elements. There is a phasing out of the last remaining quotas. Sugar quotas go by 2017. Uh, they already has, has been decided that they are abolished in uh, dairy by 2015. We reinforce the role of producer organizations, but we also try to bridge the gap between knowledge and best practices with the European Innovation Partnership that you will see in other slides. But if you look at the competitiveness, and that takes many factors into account from tariffs as well and border protection, what is important, if I find a way of moving a The slide, oh, there you go, is to look at the evolution of the agricultural trade structure in the European Union and a couple of slides on the prices that shows what is happening. On the top part, you have the evolution of our agricultural exports and the bottom part of our agricultural imports. Overall, at the export side, depending on the exchange rate, we compete with the United States for the largest exporter of agricultural products in the world. On the import side, we are by far the largest importer, importing as much as all the other big players do. There is a significant difference in the structure uh, when you compare with other parts of the world. Most of our exports are value-added, final products. They're not bulk uh, commodities. And they go to the most developed part of the world or the most advanced economically part of the emerging economies. Most, although not all, of our imports are coming from developing countries. And there is a slight increase. In fact, we have a positive trade balance, despite the fact that the exchange rate has been rather unfavorable. The euro is relatively strong compared to the US dollar. What you also see, if you look into specific commodities, is in wheat, if you go to the left of the graph and go to the 90s, what the support price of 101 euros per ton was in the past was 180. And what you see clearly is this is a market where what happens in the European Union and what happens in the rest of the world move in parallel. And that they have been doing for quite some time. This is the positive impact of the reform in a sector that started before everything else already 20 years ago. If you move into beef, the situation is a bit different because there is still border protection, although instead of being a net exporter of beef, we are a net importer of beef. Our prices are moving up, and at least with respect to U.S. prices, there is some resemblance. Brazil is a completely different story when it comes to the beef sector. Uh, what is also interesting is a very significant decline of our intervention or support price. When it comes to dairy, here is, you see a sector that has been reformed more recently, later than the other sectors. A sector that when you go back into the early 2000s, clearly our domestic price was way above the world market price, which is actually an Oceania price. And here is also a sector where pretty much we are at world uh, price levels. And this is also a sector that has been traumatized, if you want, by the crisis of 2007, but it's one where things are looking pretty positive in the future. Now. On the greenness aspect, I will focus on, three, on two numbers. 30% of all direct payments go to farmers if they meet three specific green measures. I will mention that, but that's the last slide I will have later on. But also 30%, a minimum of 30% of the rural development budget is supposed to go to agro-environmental measures to link them together. And in terms of Effectiveness, uh, already what we're trying to do is 
target the measures more specifically to the specific uh, objectives we have. Uh, what is interesting, and the only thing I will mention here, is up to 2% of the budget of the member states is meant to go to young farmers exactly for the type of challenge you mentioned before to help them enter into uh, the situation. And I will uh, finish with the last graph that tries to reflect the philosophy, the new approach of the CAP, the greening question mark I raised before. This is the one on the basis of which we're going to be judged by our citizens whether we spend the money correctly or not. And this is the one that is linked to the previous presentation. Now, some sort of a cumulative environmental benefit from the CAP is something that is already there as an objective that is supposed to be spread across all eligible area, and we do have an implementation mechanism. We do have cross-compliance. Now, cross-compliance is not a mechanism to pay farmers to respect the law, but it is a mechanism whose presence allows you to provide these incentives for violating what makes sense. These are basic regulatory elements, animal welfare, environment, or good agricultural environmental conditions that are specific to member states. And this is something that exists and covers 100% of land. This is if you want the stick. And the carrot is in the form of voluntary measures in rural development that compensate for the costs incurred or income foregone, agro-environmental measures, transitional, it's a pure green box definition of WTO if you want. And that type of incentive covers roughly 20% of eligible area right now. What we wanted to do is increase the scope of agro-environmental measures and introduce a minimum set of mandatory measures that would cover this 30% of payments. Three type of measures. First of all, keeping permanent pasture land permanent. Why? Because it helps you reduce emissions. Second, and that is not really controversial. Second, uh, crop diversification. You can call it crop rotation, but if you were to call it like that, it would mean that we have to triple the number of controls. That's why we called it how we called it. And this is, you would say, do farmers need Brussels to tell them that they need to diversify their crop production? Most farmers, not. But we have had cases of monoculture in areas doing it on wheat, others in maize, others in cotton. And that's where we want to move further in terms of uh, reducing soil erosion. And finally, 5% of land, it could go potentially to 7%, is supposed to be in some ecologically focused area, from landscape features that are meant to promote biodiversity. Now, these sound nice, but how do you put them in place? You need to have the possibility to transfer the knowledge that already exists among farmers within a member state, among the member states. You need also to be able to generate new knowledge that is required to respond to the situations. And you also need to have a farm advisory system in place where the member states will have the obligation to provide answers to farmers on some of the most basic questions that they ask on how to produce. The last element that I need to add here is that this all takes place into the context of a move towards regionalization within member states of support. Member states have the possibility to determine themselves, the regions, we would like to hope based on economic and agronomic criteria because that way a flat rate payment would help them adjust more the target of their policies to the agronomic and economic situations and better help in terms of greening. So I covered a lot of space uh, pretty briefly, but this is what I, I had to say, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have or to find more additional information in this site. Thank you very much for your attention.